Okay, all right. So we're doing uh, so we're doing beam design uh, where we're going to assume that this beam is laterally uh, supported. In other words, it can't move in and out of the in and out of the page. Okay, so as I said, this is an extension from uh, from what you would have done in third year. Uh, we'll cover beam and beam um, beams and bending theory, codified design for bending. Uh, example where we don't need any stiffeners, and then an example with stiffeners. That's what we're going to cover uh, in these classes. Uh, so the beams are going to span between uh, two or more supports, and they're going to transmit loads mainly, mainly by, by, um, mainly by bending. Okay, so we have the point load here in the middle. That could be due to, say, for example, a column coming down that supports onto the beam. Uh, then that load has to come from uh, the column through the beam uh, in bending and then shear, and then down to the support in the end. So that support could be a wall. It could be a concrete wall, for example. It could be a a, uh, another column uh, and so on that's going to transfer the loads in down into into the ground. Okay, um, there's lots of different types of beams that we can we can use. We can uh, we're going to mainly concentrate on the universal beams uh, in here. Later on in this uh, series of lectures, we're going to look at the plate girder uh, in there. So a standard beam uh, using the roll section. A universal beam or a universal column. So a universal beam, we can get it to span up to around 30 meters. Whereas if we use something like a plate girder, a plate girder could span from 100 to, uh, or sorry, from 10 to 100, 100 meters. So the plate girder is made, made up by welding uh, different plates together. So there's one plate for the web, a plate for the top flange, and a plate for the bottom flange uh, in there. So we're going to start off with beams that are uh, mainly uh, restrained laterally. So in the example down here, this is in the dash, this is the original beam uh, in there. Then that beam can deflect down the way as we load it. So if I put a point load on the middle, that can deflect down the way uh, in there. So that's the, this is the bottom flange here that's deflected down the way. But if we don't restrain this top flange uh, from moving sideways, then what can also happen is that when this top flange here goes into compression, as we bend it, the top flange is in compression, bottom flange is in tension. So the bottom flange just moves straight down. But the top flange could also, as well as moving down the way, could also move out the way. So you can see that it's uh, rotated. The section is rotated relative to where it was originally. The bottom flange stays the same, but the top flange is rotated, rotated over. Okay, so we're going to uh, look at that lateral torsional buckling uh, later on. So it's characterized by twisting and lateral deflection of a beam that's subject to bending about its uh, major axis. If we don't have lateral torsional buckling, um, the Member strength may be assessed on the basis of in-plane cross-section resistance. Uh, so we need to classify the section to see if we can get if there's going to be any local um, buckling happening. So in this example here, where the beam is bending, uh, as I said, the bottom flange is in is in tension, but this bottom fl a top flange here is in compression. And we can see top flange in compression, and then we have a local buckle here, uh, so a local permanent deformation, another local buckle here, local permanent deformation. So this beam has been loaded through the concrete slab from the load up the way, or sorry, down the way, pushing down the way. Um, but as this is bending down, uh, we end up getting some local buckling uh, in there. So we have to uh, classify the section uh, in there. And the classification section will tell us uh, how susceptible it is to local buckling. So if it's a class one section, local buckling won't happen until at least we have the full uh, plasticity uh, developed. So here we're plotting a moment against rotation. Uh, where we have the plastic uh, resistance here. So after that, then we get um, plasticity, we get strain hardening over here. Uh, if we have class two, it means we have limited ductility, so we can achieve the full uh, plastic moment capacity of the section, uh, but then it's going to have some local buckling in it. So that's the class two section. Class three section means it just achieves uh, the yield of the material, uh, and then it is going to buckle. Whereas a class four section doesn't even achieve its yield, uh, it's going to buckle early. Uh, in there, so we have a limited uh, capacity of the section due to uh, local buckling. And then just looking at what the uh, stress um, distribution is, so if I'm over here on, uh, say if I'm on E, full plasticity, that means every fibre uh, is uh, loaded up to its limit. In other words, that every fibre is, is at its yield strength, right the way from the neutral axis up to the top. Whereas if we're somewhere in the elastic range at A, it means we have neutral axis here. It means that the outer fibers are uh, stressed maximally at, at, at its, sorry, the highest stresses are at the outer fibers. So this is the uh, tension stress. This is the compression stress on the top. Um, but if we unload this, it's going to unload and there's going to be no residual or no um, locked in 
uh, stresses into the into the member. Whereas once we go into the plastic range, if we only uh, in here, and then there's going to be a permanent um, rotation at the end of the beam in there once we have it pushed past the plastic limit. Okay, so we're going to have to classify the section to see which classification it is, and then that's going to tell us whether we can use uh, the uh, plastic resistance or whether we can use the elastic resistance, or we have to actually reduce it down even further and use some sort of effective uh, value uh, in there. Okay, so we have uh, the steps that we're going to go through is going to uh, do a local buckling check of the section to classify the section. Then we're going to do a shear and buckling check. We do a bending check, combined moment and shear, deflection, and uh, resistance to transverse force uh, check at the end. Okay, so we'll do the first uh, five steps uh, in this example this morning. So here's the example. So we have a laterally restrained beam. Uh, so the beam is designed to span six and a half meters, so spanning from um, so six and a half meters, so we're going from here to here. That span there where we have L is equal to 6.5 meters. Uh, we have a point load, so the point load um, is made up. So this point load here is made up of a live load or an imposed load of 48 kilonewtons uh, in there and a um, dead load, a permanent action of 48 kilonewtons as well. So that point load could be, as I said, a column that's sitting on the middle of the beam, uh, and that's carrying another floor above it. And that other floor above it um, can have people, equipment, and so on on it. That that's um, that's creating the the imposed load QK, and then the weight of the floor above it, the weight of the self weight of the column, and so on, could be creating the dead load, which is the uh, G of K. Then we also have a a, a Another load, which is a uniform distributed load, so this load here that's uniformly distributed. So every meter that I go along that beam, I have uh, omega kilonewtons. Okay, and that omega kilonewtons is made up of uh, an imposed load of 24.2 kilonewtons per meter. So every meter I have 24.2 uh, kilonewtons of a of an imposed load, and it has a a, um, a dead load uh, G of K of 24.2 kilonewtons per meter. So similar similar dead load and and live load uh, in it. Now that just happens in this example that we have a similar dead and live load, or sorry, similar dead and imposed loads, uh, whereas in most of the time we'll have different values uh, for QK and uh, GUK in there. So we're going to design this. So the first thing we're going to have to do is uh, step one is going to be to uh, work out what the um, bending moment is and the and the shear force is for this uh, uh, for this member. Okay, so we need to work out what the bending moment diagram is and the shear force diagram for this number. So we'll start off with, with looking at what the reactions are at the end of the beam. So what would the reactions at the end of this uh, beam uh, look like? Well, we have a point load in the middle, uh, so that's going to uh, distribute to the same amount either side. So the action here, so this is A, B, and we'll say C. <coughs> so the reaction at A. So reaction at A. Uh, it's going to be from the point load, so we have half of it's going to go to the left hand side, and the reaction at uh, B up here. Uh, so half of the point load is going to go to this side. And then we have uh, this omega, uh, so we have omega kilonewtons per meter, so that's uh, over the whole beam. So over the whole beam, uh, we're going to have omega kilonewtons per meter, and the beam is half meters long, so we're going to have over the whole beam, it's omega times L. That's the total load in kilonewtons across the beam because we have every every meter of it we have a, we have omega kilonewtons. So therefore, the whole beam, uh, which is six and a half meters long, we're going to have uh, omega L. So omega L, and then half of that because it's symmetrical, half is going to go into the left hand side, and half of it is going to go into the, the right hand side. Okay, so that's the that's the reactions. We know what the reactions are. Um, we want to work out what the factored loads are, so we know what that the reactions are, but the, we want to know what the factored loads are. We want to know what the ultimate limit state uh, is. So, uh, so we want to, we need to know what the So we want to know what the ultimate limit state is because we're designing uh, in, under ultimate limit states for our bending and our shear. 
uh, in there. So the um, the point node P is equal to 1.35 uh, GUK, so the dead load plus 1.5 uh, QK, which is the live load. So that's 1.35. And G of K in this case is 48 kilonewtons. Oh, sorry, 1.35. 48 kilonewtons plus 1.5 times 48 kilonewtons. Okay, so that's the, um, the dead and the live uh, in there. And when I add up those together, I get 136 uh, kilonewtons. Okay, and again, all we get is equal to 1.35 small g of k plus 1.5 small q of k. So that's 1.35, uh, and the g of k is 24.2 kilonewtons per meter plus 1.5 is 24.2 kilonewtons per meter. Okay, uh, so that's going to equal. Uh, is that going to e that equals to sixty nine kilonewtons per meter? Okay, so that's the factored upload. So we have our factors of safety uh, in there, where we have a factor of safety for um, for the dead load of one point three five, factor of safety for the live load of one point five in there, and so therefore we have the the p value is one hundred and uh, 36 kilonewtons. So this P up here at the top is 136 kilonewtons. Um, and then we have uh, the omega value. So the distributed load is 69 kilonewtons per meter. So that's 69 kilonewtons per per meter. Okay, so that's our that's our our design loads that we're going to have to design for for the ultimate date. Uh, in there, so the next thing that we need to work out is uh, what is our so what's the bending moments? Well, we can do this, actually, we can do, yeah, we we'll did the shear force first. Okay, so we do, what, what's the shear force that we have to design for? Okay, so we're gonna, we could do the force diagram. Okay, so we said here uh, on the uh, support on the right hand side, we have RA was equal to P over two uh, plus omega L over 2. And on the left hand side, we had a, a support gun up there. RB is equal to P over 2 plus omega L uh, over 2 in there. So uh, the P value is 136 kilonewtons. So we have 136 kilonewtons divided by 2 plus omega, which is uh, 69 kilonewtons per meter times the span, which is 6.5 meters. All divided by two. Okay, so that gives us two hundred ninety-two uh, kilonewtons. Oop. Okay, so two hundred ninety-two uh, kilonewtons. So the reaction there, and the same reaction on the other side, two hundred ninety-two uh, kilonewtons. Okay, so that's the reaction on both sides. So I just tidy up here so I get a bit of myself. Okay, so we have 292 kN on, on both sides. So as I draw my uh, shear force diagram uh, in here, so I've got to start off with the line at the bottom. So the shear force diagram, so what, what's the first load I see? First load I see is this 292 kN, so I'm going to go up 292. So that's 292 kilonewtons on the left hand side. Now, do I see any load after that? So I'm on the very uh, end. So I'm on the very, oh, sorry. I'm on the very end um, here, on the very end. So I've seen 292 straight away uh, pushing me up the way. As I start to go along the beam, checking to see if I have any load, I see load straight away there. Look at that load there, which is the omega kilonewtons per meter. So every meter I go along, there's a, there's a load of omega kilonewtons pushing down the way. Okay, so omega kilonewtons pushing down the way. And we'll just write up the number that we had here. So we had, um, so uh, 
and P was 136 kilonewtons and omega was 69 kilonewtons uh, per meter. Okay, so we have, uh, we have 292 here, uh, sorry, 209, 292, 292 here straight away, uh, going up the way. And then as I go along every meter, I move along the beam. So the first meter I go along the beam, I will see 69 kilonewtons moving down the way. Second meter I go along, I see another 69 pushing me down the way, and so on and so on and so on. So just from uh, the uniform distributed load, later along, I will see 69 going down. So if I break up this beam uh, into, let's see if I can break it up evenly into six and a half uh, lengths, it's going to be just one, two, three, four, five, six. Mm, close enough, okay. That's six and a half uh, lengths uh, in there. So I say every meter I go along, I'm going to come down uh, by... Every meter I come along, I'm going to come down by. Every meter I come along, I'm going to come down by 69 kilonewtons per meter. So I'm at 292, so I'm one meter down along. So it's going to be 292 minus uh, 69 uh, in there. So then that means as I come along here, as I come along here, then I'm. 292 minus 69 uh, in there, so I set uh, 3, say, 23, so 273, uh, if I've got it right. No, sorry, not 273, 223. So 223, then I come along another, by another meter, and I need to take another 69 off. Okay, so I've got, I'm 223 here because it's 292 minus uh, 69. And then I come another meter long, so there's another 69 that's pushing uh, down the way. So another 69 uh, pushing down the way. So then I keep going down. And then so 69 away from that is a four uh, and a uh, seven, so 150. Uh, 154 and so on and so on so every meter I come along now that's one two three we know that at the middle so we have to be we know that at the middle here at this middle point here be careful because it's at the middle point we're going to have a sudden point node that's going to go down as well so what ends up happening is obviously as I keep going along and going down by 69 go down by another 69 and then I have a sudden jump uh, down here. So when I go down by another 69, so that's 154. Uh, take away uh, 69 from that. So it's a, is that a, a 5. Is that 85, is it? 85, is it? I don't know why I'm doing that wrong. So 69 away from that. 85. And then I'm going to move it uh, down. Oh, no, I've done something wrong here. Sorry. 8, 8, 16. Whoa, I've done my calculations wrong. Sorry. So 292. Uh, I'm going to move down by uh, 69 kilonewtons every every meter uh, in there. So I've done something wrong. Hold on. 69. 229. Where have I made my mistake? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm, that's 85 uh, is here. So 85 is there, so that's another meter over. Uh, and then come along here. Uh, and then I'm, I'm halfway along here, so I've got every meter. Now I'm only a half meter to take off this time, and that should hopefully take me to 68. How do I know it's 68? Because I know from the uniform distributed uh, load that's along here. So this uniform distributed load, I know that when I draw that normally, uh, I will have the reaction up here. I will pass through zero at midpoint and down to the same reaction on the other side there. So I know that that has to be zero. And then the point load is 136. So I know that that's, that's going to bring me from uh, 68 because the point load would be 68 on one side, down, and 60, and then back over. So we can see here that it's 68 uh, here and it's 68 over there. So that point load in the middle, half it goes over here, half it goes over here. So that part of the diagram, um, 
here. This part of the shear force diagram here, that's the 68 high all the way along. That's your P over 2. That's the P over 2 part. Uh, and the other parts of the diagram here, top part here. So it's like superposition. So it is superposition. Uh, in there, that top part of the diagram is related to the uniform distributed load. In there. Okay, so that's uh, so I know that has to be zero at the middle due to the uniform distributed load, and it's only L over two um, on the on the left hand side here, it's zero in the middle. Okay, so when I continue drawing that uh, down here, so I get minus uh, sixty eight here. So I start at sixty eight kilonewtons uh, up at the top here. Point load comes down, and the other half it goes underneath, and then I keep going along. It's it's a steady uh, increase because it's a uniform distributed load along, and then I get minus. 292 kilonewtons on the other side as well. Okay, so that's my uh, shear force diagram I've drawn. So I have uh, 292 kilonewtons on the left hand side. I have uh, 68 here, minus 68 here, and then minus 292 on the other side. So that's the, the shear force diagram that we need to design for. Now we also have to design for uh, the bending moment diagram. Uh, so as I said, um, you know, oh, okay. Uh, previously, so the shear force diagram, the bending moment diagram, there's a number of different ways we can uh, get it. One is we can get the area under the, the curves uh, in there, and that will give us the bending moment diagram. So if I want to draw the bending moment diagram here, I could get the area of uh, that I've highlighted in red and add the area uh, that I've highlighted in orange here. And that would give me the bending moment diagram or the bending moment at the at the center here. So if I, I could do that. Uh, so. I don't think I have enough room there. Let's see if I have enough room. So the bending moment diagram uh, in here. So the bending moment uh, diagram is going to kind of look something like that. And if I look at the moment at the middle, that moment at the middle, I said it could be the area under the curve. So if I take the uh, red part uh, under the curve, so the red part is 68 kilonewtons high. And its uh, its width is L over two, so it's three point two five meters in length. Okay, so it's um, six and a half uh, meters overall. So therefore, L over two is uh, three point uh, two five, and then the height of this is sixty eight kilonewtons. So that's that area, and then I can add on the um, the area in from the triangle. So we know that the triangle is half the base by the perpendicular height. So half of 3.25 meters and times the height of it. So the height of it is, sorry, 292 minus 68. Apologies, I'm not space. Okay, so that's 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 the moment uh, in there at the mid span, which is um, the area of the triangle plus the area of the rectangle there. So that's one way of of getting the bend the moment diagram. And so that value here. Oh, so that 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 uh, sorry that one is called MED that moment on the on the middle there. So if I calculate if I calculate that, I guess uh, a value for uh, MED is equal to five hundred and eighty-five kilonewton uh, meter. So that's that's there at the mid at the mid span. Okay, so I can do it that way. That's one way of getting the getting the bending moment. Uh, the next way I could get the bending moment where we know that the reaction at A was 292 kilonewtons. Uh, we know that the reaction at B is equal to 292 uh, two kilonewtons. We know that the uh, um, uniform distributed load was 969 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, we know that the uh, point load is 136. Uh, kilonewtons. So we can get the bending moment uh, diagram by looking at the at the forces uh, in there. So, so I want to know what the bending moment diagram is. So I want to know what the MED is at the center of it. So if I took a, a little section through the center here, so sections are here at midpoint. 
uh, and I look to the say left and I say well what's the what's the moments that I can see at the left hand side well I can see RAD away from me so I can see that our uh, sorry RA and I can see that that's at a distance of L over 2 I can see that that's a distance of L over 2 away okay so four times lever arm uh, gives a moment and that's going uh, clockwise so so that's giving me a, a moment that way so that moment component uh, sorry and that has a distance of l over two away okay so that's where i'm getting that bit we also have um the moment due to the um, uniform distribution load along here so that's the uniform distribution load along there and uh, what i can do is i can say well that does an equivalent point load that acts through the middle there so I can say that's an equivalent point load that acts through the middle there. And that equivalent point load uh, is equal to the total uh, force that's on, on this part of this section. So uh, that's WL over 2, because it's uh, acting over L over 2. Uh, and it's uh, uh, it's omega um, kilonewtons per, per meter. OK, so then I can take that into account when I'm designing it. So then that's at a distance of uh, L over 4 away. Uh, so then I can, uh, I can, uh, and that's acting uh, the opposite direction. So that's minus, that's uh, acting down the way. Okay, so this one's coming down the way. Uh, about where I'm standing here in the center, it's coming down the way. So it's coming anti-clockwise, whereas the other one's going clockwise. So it's minus uh, omega L over 2 times the distance of uh, L over 4 away. So then I guess, uh, so uh, I get RA direction times L over 2 minus omega L squared over over 8. Uh, and then when I work that out, hopefully that comes out to be the same, that uh, I end up getting uh, uh, MED here on the centre, 585 uh, kN uh, metres when I put them in. Okay, so that's our uh, so that's our, our forces uh, got that we have to design for. Um, so the next thing we need to do is uh, if we go back to the same. So we need to go through the different things. So we know what the force that we need to design for is now. We know what the shear force is, uh, VED. We know what the bending moment is, uh, MED. So we now have to try and find a suitable section to be able to carry that. Um, uh, load safely uh, without uh, without failing in bending, without failing in in shear. So we need to go through all these steps: the local buckling checks um, to, to to classify the section. Um, by classifying the section, we need to check for shear. We need to check for bending, combined moment and shear, and deflection. But we're in a bit of a sticky situation now. We don't to be able to do all those checks. We need to pick a section size. So how do we pick a section size? Uh, um, in there, so we know what we know what the moment is, uh, 585 kilonewton meters to design for. We know what the shear force is, um, so the shear force VED that we're going to design for. The maximum shear force there from our shear force diagram was 292 kilonewtons, which is what uh, their supports are close to the supports. So how are we going to pick the the section uh, size? So we we know typically uh, in a beam like this, what is driving uh, the design is the moment uh, is driving the design. So if we can use the moment or the demand uh, on, on this section to try and estimate what uh, the uh, what the um, what size section we might need to withstand that moment. Okay, so so we know that the the demand on the section. So we know that the demand uh, M E D is five hundred eighty five. Meters. Okay. So in our design, we have to make assumptions sometimes along the way, and then we go back and check the assumptions. So I'm going to make an assumption here where I'm going to assume uh, that the section is a class one or two. Okay, so it's class one or two. So when we look at uh, the rotation versus moment, we said that we can develop um, we can develop the full uh, so class one or class two, this would be class one out here, and class two would be here. So we're able to develop the full um, uh, plasticity for class one, and we're able to develop limited plasticity for uh, for class two. 
but we're able to get past the yield. So therefore, uh, when we go to the to the code, um, that tells us that, well, if it's a class one or a class two section uh, in there, so if it's a sale in this class one or class two section uh, in there, then that implies, so then if we go to close, uh, that implies clause uh, 6.2.5 in Eurocode 3 part 1 part 1. That will tell us that the moment of resistance uh, in CY or uh, D is going to be equal to the uh, plastic modulus uh, times the yield strength all divided by gamma m naught. So we could use that equation for class 1 or class 2 sections. So that's for class 1 or Two. Okay, so that's one thing. So, so we, uh, so we know what the uh, plasma is. And also, what the code tells us is that we need the utilize it. Oh. Okay. Mm. So uh, the utilization ratio in bending, so for the bending moment, is equal to the demand divided by the capacity. And that always has to be less than or equal to one. OK, so that implies uh, that the capacity the section has to be greater than or equal to the demand. And the capacity of the section for class one or class two uh, is equal to the plastic modulus times Fy all over gamma m naught. That has to be greater than or equal to the demand that's on the on the section. And therefore, to try and work out what section size we should use, we can work out whether the plastic modulus should be greater than or equal to the demand times the material factor of safety and the partial factor of safety divided by Fy. Now, if we're going to assume that it's a grade S275, which we have uh, said in, the, in it, and the thickness of the flange is less than or equal to 40 millimeters. So that's another assumption. Okay, so that's two assumptions we made already. Already, So the thickness of the flange is less than 40 of that. Then uh, table. 3.1 implies Fy is equal to 275 newtons per millimeter squared. Okay, so that's uh, if we have grade S275, which we which is what we were given in the in the question, uh, and if we have the thickness of the flange is less than or equal to 40 millimeters, then table 3.1 in Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1 will tell us that Fy is 275 uh, newtons per per millimeter squared. Okay, so we can put that into our equation here. So WPL has to be greater than or equal to the, the moment uh, which we're designing for, which is 585 um, uh, kilonewtons uh, meters. So if I turn that into newton millimeters, so I have that's by 10 to the power of 6 newton millimeters, all multiplied by the factor of safety, which is 1, all divided by 275. And newtons per millimeter squared. So that means the plastic modulus uh, has to be greater than or equal to. Now to calculate it. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if someone has a calculator there, you can tell me what the answer is. Okay, so 585 uh, by 10 to the power of uh, 6 divided by 275. So I got that right. It's uh, 23.4. No, 2.34. Is it? Wait. Go again. 
pair. So 585 divided by 275, I've got 2.127 by 10 to the power 6. Um, and then, so the Newtons cancel out. There's a millimeter on top there, and there's a millimeter per millimeter squared on the bottom. So I'm going to get millimeters to the power of 3. Uh, and that's equal to, if I turn that into, um, into centimeters, I get 2. Uh, Two one, uh, two seven um, centimeters cubed. Okay. 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 So centimeter cubes. Okay. So, so the bottom of the screen is cut off. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. So uh, that's um, I'll do it up here. Sorry. Uh, WPL uh, is greater than or equal to 2.127 by 10 to the power of 6 millimeters to the power of 6. Sorry, millimeters to the power of 3. Uh, and then, uh, so that's greater than or equal to 2127 centimeter cubed. Okay. So I can't see that on the screen. So, that's, uh, so I'll move that back up. So that's the plastic uh, modulus. Okay. So I need to pick a section that's the plastic modulus is greater than uh, 2.127 uh, uh, in there. Okay. Okay. So I've got, uh, so I need the plastic modulus. That's a great length to 2127 uh, centimeters cubed. Okay, so then I, I go to Blue Book. And find a section, which is a UKB, because that's what I've been told to use, uh, with WPL, great length to 2127 uh, centimeter cubed. Okay, so I just can't switch over to get the blue book here, but if you open up the blue book uh, in front here, so I'm going to try um, a 533 by 210 UKB um, 92 upgrade grade S275. Now in that with uh, the plastic modulus from that, from the blue book, I'll just check the blue book uh, is 2360 oh, centimeters cubed, which is greater than 2127. Uh, okay, so that should be okay. Okay, so that's our trial section that we're going to trial uh, in there. So we've said, so it should, that means that our bending should be fine because we're trying a 533 by uh, 210 UKB that it weighs 92 kilograms for, for every meter. Okay, so that's what we're going to try. And then from the blue book, then we're going to get uh, all the different uh, parameters that we need to get from, from us. So to classify the section, uh, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get um, first the thickness of the flange. So from the blue book, book uh, we get the parameters. So we have the our section. Oh, for the mess, and now I, I have uh, to write with my finger here because I don't have a stylus. Okay, from that blue book, we need to definitely need to know what the thickness of the flange is so that we can first check that assumption where we made the assumption that uh, the thickness of the flange is less than 40 millimeters uh, in there. So we need to we need to know that. Um, then we also uh, so the thickness of the flange here, I think, is. 15.6 uh, millimeters. We'll also need to know uh, things like the overall height of the section. The overall height of the section, and this is uh, 533.1. So these are all in millimeters. Uh, we'll need to know the thickness of the web. From the blue book, thickness of the web is 10.1 millimeters. Uh, in there. We'll need to know the uh, width of the flange. 
So B, uh, so B is 209.3. Two hundred nine point three millimeters. Okay, and we will need to know the little uh, radius here on the corners. So R, so root radius uh, here, I think it's ten point seven. Okay, so that's some of the basic uh, parameters that, that we need for this uh, for this section. Uh, in there, and then obviously then we have a neutral axis here, and we have a neutral oh, axis down the middle, where that's the major axis, and then we have the minor axis going in the in the other direction. Okay, so that's our that's our section. Um, so we're going to classify this section. So our first step uh, we're going to do in our design is to uh, after we've got our loads, so we're going to class classification the section, and there's a reason why we. And we need to do this is we need to see if it's susceptible to local buckling or not. Okay, so classification of the section. So what's important in terms of the classification section? So it's the parts of that uh, member uh, that um, are susceptible to local buckling. So it's going to be the compression flange that we need to uh, concern ourselves about. And we're going to need to know parts of the web. So for example, when I come from here outside the root radius, this little part of the steel here, I can see that's a relatively slender piece of uh, steel so i'm going to be concerned about that uh, in here that that uh, bit there might get uh, some local buckling and the same on the other side as well so that's one place i'm going to classify uh, for sure to check and another place that i'm going to classify will be the the web itself so the web may also uh, end up um, having some uh, local buckling in it so there's the oop, there are the two uh Two key uh, places where I need to uh, where I need to check the section um, for local buckling. Okay, so this uh, bit at the top here that I've just drawn, that's going to be CF. So I need to look at the ratio of CF versus TF, and that will tell me how slender that member is. Uh, so for the flange, I'm interested in this ratio of CF divided by TF. That gives me the slenderness of the flange. And I can get that directly from the blue book. So that's 5.57. Uh, I'm also interested in the web. So I need to know what the web slenderness is. So this part here, up until the root radius starts going around. Okay, so up there, we're starting to see how it gets a bit thicker there where the root radius going around. So it's the unstiffened length uh, as far as the root radius. So really, it should be as far as here, up to there. So that's the, uh, that's the, CW that I'm interested in, and obviously the thickness of the web as well. So for the web, I'm interested in the slender, how slender that plate is that's uh, in the web. So that's CW divided by TW, and then directly out the blue book for this section for the 533 by 210 UKB 92, uh, that's 47.2. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the slenderness of the flange, that's the slenderness of the, of the web. Now I need to go and check those values. Uh, for the flange and the web against the limits uh, set in the in the in the code. So I got that. So I go to the table. So table five point uh, two, and there. So the first one I have here is the maximum width to thickness ratio for the from the from the webs. So we can see in the diagram up here at the top. Uh, there's the web that I'm looking at. Uh, in there. So that's the one different uh, length of it. So that's the web. So we're looking at that, we're classifying, uh, we're classifying the web. So in our example, um, here we had uh, CW divided by uh, thickness of the web uh, is equal to, from the blue book, was equal to 47.2. Okay. Now we have, uh, we have options here. So we have the classification of the section. So it's a class one, class two, or class three uh, section. So we have, if it's subject to bending or subject to compression. So we have it subject to bending because this is a, a beam that's bending. If it was a column or a, a truss member, it's just subject to compression only. But we have it subject to bending, so therefore uh, some of it uh, is in compression. Some of the strands of the top ones uh, would be in compression from here on, neutral axis across there. The top flange and the, this part of the web are in compression, whereas this part of the web is in tension, so is the bottom part here. So. Uh, if it's in tension, you won't get local buckling. It's not going to move out uh, sideways. 
in there. So that's going to stay where it is. The, basically, the T that's below the line, below the neutral axis, that T is going to stay where it is. Whereas the top bit that goes into compression, that could buckle off sideways. So that, that could move off sideways here, uh, or the top uh, flange can move over there. So we have to really check uh, this one for local buckling uh, in there. So, uh, so we're going to use this part here, subject to bending. And these are the limits. So if it's a class one section, um, that um, one stiffened length of the web divided by the thickness of the web has to be less than or equal to 72 epsilon. If it becomes, uh, if it happens that it doesn't meet that uh, limit, then we check to see if it's less than or equal to 82 epsilon. And if it is less than 80, sorry, 83 epsilon, if it's less than that and greater than 72, then it's a class two section. If it's greater than 83, but less than 124 epsilon, uh, then it's a class three section. And if it's greater than 124 epsilon, then it's a class four section. So we need to look what epsilon is. So we see epsilon here is the square root of 235 over fy. Uh, so epsilon, is equal to the square root of 235 divided by Fy. Uh, and we know that uh, Fy, as we worked out in the page before, because um, the thickness of the web, or thickness, sorry, thickness of the flange was less than uh, two, was less than 40 millimeters. Um, so therefore, and the thickness of the web is less than 40 millimeters. So therefore, Fy is equal to 275 newtons per millimeter squared. And then we know from uh, the bottom of the of uh, table uh, 5.2, we know when Fy is equal to 275, we get epsilon uh, is equal to, oh, sorry, you can't see it on the page there, epsilon is equal to 0.92. Okay, so so that's just coming from this equation here, so that's equal to 0.92. So that's actually worked out in the bottom of table 5.2 uh, feet. So for, uh, for class one, uh, section CW over TW has to be less than or equal to 72 epsilon, uh, which is equal to basically 72 times 0.92. Uh, okay, um, 72 times uh, 0.92, and I think that's equal to. Uh, 66.6 .6. okay and then in our case for our section uh, that we have we have cw over tw is 47.2 uh, uh, and 47.2 is less than 66.6 uh, okay so so that implies a uh, class one section Oh no. Sorry. Okay, so it's, so it's a class one, uh, it's a class one section uh, for the web. So class one, not section. It's a class one. It's a class one web. Okay. So it's a, so it's class one web. Uh, then we have to look at the flange. So similar, we have to look at the flange here. So it's on on uh, on stiff and length of the flange, which is this part here that we're looking at. So the on stiff and length of the flange. So we had worked out for our section that CF divided by uh, TF. That ratio from the blue book we had 5.57. Um, Similar to uh, the other uh, one for the web, so this is sheet two of three in table 5.3, uh, where we have classification sections. So if, if it's subject part subject to compression, which we have in this case, so the flange is under compression here. If the C over T ratio uh, is less than 0.9 epsilon, then it's a class one section. If it's between 10 and 9, it's a class two section. Between 14 and 10, it's a class three section. And greater than 14, it's a class four uh, section in there. Okay, so. 
what have we got uh, here? Um, well, we've got, uh, so for class one, uh, so C divided by T um, has to be less than or equal to nine epsilon, which is nine times 0 0.9. Um, two, Sorry. so that's uh, less than or equal to that's uh, nine nine eighty one. So that's equal to eight point uh, three two. Okay, and so uh, R C F by the T F is five point five seven, which is less than uh, eight point three two. Um, so that implies it's a class one. Uh, flange. Okay, so we had a class uh, a class two flange, or sorry, class one flange. We had also class one web. So therefore, the overall section is class one. So that implies overall section is class one. Okay. If the flange was uh, class two and the web was class uh, one, then we would end up there as a class two section. So it's it's classified overall as whichever is the uh, the worst um, classification of the of the component parts. So in this case, both the flange and the web are class one, so it's class one. But if the say web was class three, the flange was class one, then we would uh, classify the overall section as class three. Okay, so we've classified the section uh, as class one. So in there, so by using uh, that one, um, yeah, we used the this table three point one um, to. Uh, work out what the FOI was. So we had the nominal thickness of the flange because that's the thickest part of the element is less than 40 millimeters. Therefore, FOI uh, for S275 steel is 275 newtons per millimeter squared. The ultimate strength, if we needed it, is 430 newtons per millimeter squared. You can see that if we had a thicker flange, so something between 40 and 80 millimeters, then we have a reduced uh, yield. So instead of 275 newtons per millimeter squared of a yield strength, it goes down to 255 newtons per millimeter squared, and the ultimate goes from 430 down to 410. Okay, so we've done the local buckling check now on that one. So now we're on to uh, the shear buckling, shear and shear buckling check. So the design um, uh, shear. Design, uh, design shear, so the shear doesn't normally have a significant influence on the design of the beams, unless we have something like uh, in the example down below here, uh, where we have got, um, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, in the example here, where we have a uniform distributed load on the beam, uh, this is our shear force diagram, as well as the bit of diagram. We can see here around the support condition where we have high shear, and we also have high moment as well. So in this beam, and design this beam, we would have to be very careful because we have high level of shear and high level of bending in the one in the one location, which uh, means that you know, we have we're using the web and uh, this area here mainly for shear, and we're using the flanges mainly for uh, to resist the, the bending. And we have to be very very careful in that in that uh, instances where we have a high coincidence of shear and moment occur around the same the same spot. Uh, so when we look at what the Eurocode uh, tells us, Eurocode 3, part 1, part 1, for shear, shear is checked in accordance with uh, clause 6.2.6 .6, uh, in there. So as per all the checks, the first thing we, we or what we're really uh, doing is we're checking that the design value of the shear, so in other words, the demand, VED, divided by the capacity, VCRD, has to be less than or equal to 1.0. So VCRD is the design resistance, VCR, or, yeah, it's a design resistance. Um, and uh, for plastic design, then the design resistance is given as according to equation uh, two. So equation two being down here, uh, VPLRD is A, uh, V, which is a shear area, times FY um, divided by the square root of uh, three. So that's FY divided by the square root of three. This part here is effectively your, um, your uh, shear strength. Okay, so that we know that a material like steel its shear, its strength, uh, the material, the strength in shear uh, is a lot smaller than its uh, strength in um, in axial uh, load. Okay, so if I got a piece of paper, uh, if you get a piece of paper uh, and you try and catch the two ends of the page and, and, and pull them apart, it takes a certain amount of force to rip that uh, page. However, if you take the same page and you try and um, um, 
uh, rip it across the middle, we'll say. Uh, in shear, you uh, can can rip it a lot easier. So it's um, uh, the 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 shear strength uh, is equal to um, the axial strength of the material divided by square root of three. So that's where that comes from in the in the equation. Uh, on the bottom of the equation uh, here, we have the uh, partial um, factor of safety for the materials, which is uh, gamma m zero, which is just one. Uh, and then we also have the um, shear area. So the shear area, which was was shown on the in the previous um, slide. Oh, there it is there on the on the right hand side. So that's the that's the shear area uh, that we have to have to calculate. And that shear area is given by um, 6.2.6 clause uh, 3 underneath that, where the shear area uh, here at the bottom we have AV, that's the shear area, is equal to the overall area of the section. So we take the overall area of the section. So if we take the section here, it's the overall area of this section, which you get directly from the blue book. Uh, we would take away um, the width of the flange, which is here. So we take away that width of the flange. Um, so that's B. Uh, the thickness of the flange, TF, which is here. And there's two of them. So effectively, you're taking away uh, all of this at the top here and all of this at the bottom here. OK, so that's what that's that part. Um, so you have the overall area first. You take away the two of those. Now we're left with everything in red, bar the stuff that's overlapping with the, with the purple. Uh, and then you add back in the thickness of the web, uh, two times uh, R times the thickness of the flange. So we're effectively uh, adding back in so um, let me see. So this component here, we're going to add back uh, in that component, which is which is effectively uh, this bit up here uh, and this bit down here. Okay. So that's uh, so that's where that that's where that equation comes from. Uh, and then that can't be any uh, any smaller uh, than this value here. So A V. Uh, has to be um, greater than or equal to new times the height of the web times the thickness of the web uh, in there. Okay, so uh, new we can conservatively take as equal to 1.0. Uh, HW, so HW is equal to the overall height of the um, of the section minus twice the thickness of the flange. Okay, so that's HW from there to there. Okay, so it's the overall height of the section minus twice the thickness of the flange. So that's how we uh, define the um, the area. So that's for a rolled I or H section like what we have, where we're loading parallel to the web, which is what which is what we are in this uh, in this case. And then if we have a channel section, that that's the formula underneath it. Um, there for a channel section, where the shear area is this, uh, and if we have a rolled T section, uh, then the shear area is equal to this one. We also have to check for uh, shear buckling, so shear buckling for the web. So we have the uh, the web over here. We don't want that web to locally uh, buckle uh, out here as a, as a result of uh, as a result of the shear force on it. So we have to check to make sure that this member here isn't overly slender, um, that we can uh, that it doesn't uh, buckle out sideways. So the shear buckling check for webs without any stiffness is checked in accordance with um, clause 6.2.6, .6, part 6, uh, in Euro code 3, part 1. So we're the height of the web divided by the thickness of the web. So we're looking at this slenderness here, basically how high, so the height of this, the web, um, divided by the thickness of the web. So this is the thickness of the web. Okay, so we're really interested in how slender the member is. So the height here, HW. Um, divided by the thickness. So the, the, the taller it is relative to um, the thickness of the plate, then the more slender it is. Okay, so as that gets more slender, um, if it if it's greater than 72 epsilon, so epsilon being the square root of two, um, 235 divided by Fy, so in our example it's 0.92, uh, divided by nu, uh, which we can conservatively take as equal to uh, 1. So if, um, if our uh, section is slender, is more slender than that value, 72 times 0.92 divided by 1. Uh, so in our example here, that is equal to 72 times 0.92 all over 1. Uh, so if this value here uh, is greater than that, then we need to go into Eurocode um, 3, part 1, part 5. Uh, in there, so Eurocode 3, part 1, part 5, and do some uh, detailed calculations accordingly.
So let's uh, let's let's check that. So we're going to do the, um, the shared capacity. So we've classified the section uh, first. So now we're going to do um, the check for for shear. Um, shear booked in. We do first. So uh, so we do a shear booked in check. So as I said, that comes from uh, 6.2.66 in Euro code 3, part 1, part uh, 1. Here's this, the, the shear booked in. Uh, and um, we have to check that H, W, over the thickness of the web, the height of the web, divided by the thickness of the web. Uh, which is equal to, we said, the height minus twice the thickness of the flange all over the thickness of the web, and the height um, of uh, this section is equal to 533.1 uh, divided by twice uh, the thickness of the flange, which is 15.6. 15.6 all over the thickness of the web, which is 10.1. Uh, so that's 501.9 divided by 10.1, which is 49.7. Uh, okay, so that's 49.7. So that's that uh, value. And then that value, so that's less than or equal to hopefully 72 times epsilon over nu which is 72 times 0.92 uh, all over 1, uh, which is equal to 66.6. Okay, so that implies uh, shear buckling is okay. Okay, so if the shear buckling uh, check is okay. So now check the shear. Yeah, so we're going to check the, the shear capacity or the shear resistance of the of the section, which is in the same 6.2.6 in your code um, 3, part 1, part 1. Okay, so, you know, we have to, so what we're aiming for is that the utilization ratio, which is the demand divided by the capacity, is less than or equal to 1.0. Uh, so that comes from the equation uh, 6, uh, 18 in the euro code. Okay, uh, and then where uh, AV, or sorry, where where VCR uh, D um, is equal to the plastic design resistance and shear which we said is equal to the um, shear area uh, times the um, shear strength, which is Fy divided by square root of uh, 3, all divided by the material factor safety uh, in there. Uh, sorry, that first equation is 617, and this equation uh, is equal to 618. Okay. Um, and then the shear area is equal to the overall area of the section, which we get from the blue book, minus 2 times B times the thickness of the flange, um, plus the thickness of the web, uh, plus twice the um, root radius times the thickness of the flange. And we said that that has to be at least equal to the overall um, uh, area of the web, which is the height of the web times the thickness of the web times new. Okay, so that's uh, clause 6.2.6, part uh, three of it. Okay, so when we look up the blue book, uh, we get the overall shear area um, is um, 11,700 minus twice. Uh, the flange is 209.3. Sorry, the width of the flange is 209.3. The thickness of the flange is 15.6 plus uh, the thickness of the wear, which is 10.1, plus twice 
um, uh, tw twice the radius 12.7. I think I wrote that down wrong on the previous uh, page. Sorry about that. So 12.7 multiplied by 15.6, which is the um, so when I, when I uh, do all that out, I get 5,720 millimeters squared. Yeah. I have to check to make sure uh, that that has to be greater than or equal to, sorry, so the shear area has to be greater than or equal to a new HW, TW, and that's equal to, so 1.0, for new HW that we worked out at the top there, which is 501.9, and the thickness of the web, which is 10.1. Uh, 10 uh, let's work that out. Uh, so 501.9 times 10.1. So it's equal to five or six nine point one point two. Okay. So we can see that this uh, value is greater than this value. So so therefore uh, A V is equal to five seven two O uh, millimeters squared. Okay. Okay, so we've worked out what the um, shear area uh, is. Now we can work out what the capacity of the section is. So we have um, the capacity of the section uh, being B, C, R, D um, equal to A, B, F, Y divided by gamma. Or sorry, F, Y divided by square root of 3, which is uh, shear strength divided by gamma M naught. We know what the shear area that we just uh, worked out uh, is, which was 5720 uh, millimeter squared, multiply by 275 newtons per millimeter squared. It's worth your while actually writing down the units because it's easy to make sure that you have the right um, units in there. So I've got, uh, I've got millimeter squared here. I've got uh, newtons per millimeter squared here. Uh, and then I divided by uh, gamma uh, m naught, which is zero. So if I cancel those out, I see I'm newton per millimeter squared and I'm millimeter squared, so I should end up with uh, with newtons uh, left, uh, which I get 903 by 10 to the power of 3 newtons, uh, which is 903 uh, kilonewtons. Okay, so VCRG is equal to 903 uh, kilonewtons. Okay, so that's the, that's the capacity of the section in shear. Uh, so anywhere along that member, uh, the six and a half meters long, anywhere along that member, um, the capacity in shear is 903. So then what is the utilization ratio? So to utilization. Uh, ratio in shear, which is equal to the demand, so the design, the shear, shear strength, or the shear force design, divided by the capacity. And we know that from our shear force diagram, we had 292 kilonewtons as the design, and we have 903 uh, kilonewtons of the capacity. So that's around 0.32. Uh, so that's less than or equal to 1. So it's OK in shear. OK, so it's OK in shear. Uh, in the so we've been able to uh, check this member. So it's OK in shear. It's 0.32. Not only is it OK in shear, that's a relatively low shear. So once it's less than 0.5 um, of the utilization ratio, we call that low shear. So it's OK in shear, but it's also a uh, low shear. OK, so we've done the shear and the shear Buckton check, and it's passed that. Now we're on to the, the third uh, step along the way, which is the 
the bending check. Uh, so again, lifting out uh, the Euro codes directly out of the Euro code three, part one, um, part one. So 6.2.5 is the bending moment. Again, what we're looking at is what the design value is, the demand uh, at each cross section. We have to make sure that the demand at each cross section um, is less than uh, the capacity. In other words, the demand divided by the capacity has to be less than or equal to one. So that's the very first check and that's uh, equation 6.1.2. Uh, then we have the design resistance. So on the bottom line here, the design resistance all depends on the classification of the section as I explained earlier on. So if we can develop full plasticity, it's a class one or class two section. Therefore, we can use the plastic um, bending moment capacity, which is your uh, plastic modulus times your um, material strength, your yield strength divided by the Material factor of safety or your partial uh, safety factor, which is this one in this case. If it's a class three section, we said it can just um, get up to its yield. So, therefore, instead of using the plastic modulus, we're going to use the elastic modulus. So, we're going to work out what the moment is. Um, the elastic moment is so it's the elastic modulus multiplied by the material um, strength or the, yeah, the material uh, yield strength divided by uh, the partial uh, factor of safety. So that's uh, equation 6.1.4. And if we can't even achieve um, that yield because we're going to get local buckling uh, in the elastic range, then we have to work out what an effective value is. So an effective modulus value is. Uh, multiply that by the material strength divided by the material factor of safety uh, in there. So uh, the elastic modulus and the effective modulus corresponds to the fiber with the maximum elastic stress. So that would typically be the fiber at the very, very outside edge, so the top of the flange or the bottom of the, or the flange, or the, the top, the outside of the top flange or the, the soften or the bottom uh, side of the bottom flange. Okay, so, so as I said, it depends on what, where we're at. So we said in our case, we have a class uh, one section. So that means we can get full plasticity over here. Uh, we can develop full plasticity in the section. So that means every fiber is being yielded. Uh, whereas there's something like a class three section um, in there where it uh, means that only the outside fiber has been yielded. The other fibers, uh, the outside fiber is at yield. Uh, the other fibers aren't uh, yield. So we have a class one section uh, here. So we're going to use, uh, because we have a class one section, uh, we're going to use this equation uh, here. We're going to get the plastic modulus. And the plastic modulus we just take straight from um, the uh, blue book, and we're designing around the major axis. So we just take the plastic modulus about the YY uh, axis. Okay, so let's do that uh, here. So we're looking at the moment resistance. So the moment resistance um, is from clause 6.2.5 in your code uh, 3, part 1, part 1. Okay, so as I said, the very first thing uh, that we write down is that make sure that the demand divided by the capacity has to be less than or equal to 1. And that's uh, from equation 612 and then the capacity so for uh, we've got a class one section the capacity we said is equal to the uh, plastic resistance in the section uh, and that's equal to the plastic modulus times the material uh, factor of safety. Oh, sorry, sorry, the material strength divided by the partial factor of safety uh, in there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's equation 613. And then from the blue book, for our section, we find that the um, Plastic modulus about the YY. So, about the Y, we're looking around the YY axis, so about the major axis. Uh, the plastic modulus 2360 centimeters um, cubed. So, we got that from earlier on. So, then we know that the plastic resistance is equal to 2360. I'm going to turn that into 
um, millimeters. So by 10 to the power of 3 to get millimeters cubed in there because I've got my strength in, in newtons per millimeter squared. So I'll make sure I have the same units. All divided by the material factor safety or the partial factor safety in there. And if I work that out, I get 649 by 10 to the power of 6 newtons. Uh, millimeters okay and it's a moment it should be a force certain distance so that's in newton times millimeters and i know that that's uh, right because i've got millimeters cubed here i've got per millimeter squared so that leaves me with a millimeter and i've got a newton there so it's a newton millimeter and i know that a moment is always a force times a distance so force in newtons a distance in millimeters so i know that i've got the right uh, units there so that's uh 649 uh, kilonewton meters okay so just divide by 10 to the power of six because the newtons to kilonewtons divide by 10 to the power of 3 and get the millimeters to meters is divided by 10 to the power of 3 so I'm 649 uh, kilonewton meters and then I look at the utilization ratio uh, which is said as the demand divided by uh, the capacity and the demand uh, we got from our bending moment diagram which is 585 kilonewton meters our capacity is 649 kilonewton meters uh, and then that's uh, 0.90, which is less than or equal to 1, um, implies OK in bending. OK, so it's past the, it's past the check in, in bending uh, in there. So that's, uh, so that's the bending check uh, passed. So number four, the fourth uh, check now is the combined moment and shear. It's a fourth check. So we've combined moment and shear. So as I said, if we have the... The presence of shear in a section will theoretically reduce this moment capacity, but it depends on how much shear we have um, relative to the capacity of the section. So it depends on demand compared to the, the section. So in practice, what really happens is that we have the shear uh, demand uh, is less than the capacity than 50% of the capacity. So up here. Go back to the bending check. Sorry, someone asked me to go back to the bending check. And there, okay, so utilization ratio is the uh, moment divided by uh, the capacity. So the moment from the bending moment diagram. So uh, this one here, that 585 we got from the bending moment uh, diagram uh, earlier on that we worked out, 585 kilonewton meters divided by the capacity that gives us 0 0.9, and that's less than or equal to uh, 1. Okay. Okay, so we combine moment and shear. Um, so here we're saying that the impact of shear can be neglected up to 50% of the plastic resistance. So in other words, um, what does that mean? That means that if I have the demand, uh, so if I have VED, if I have the demand divided by the capacity, and if that's less than or equal to 0 0.5, less than or equal to 50%, that implies I can ignore combined uh, moment and shear so that's really the main check that we do if we can if we if, if it is less than 0 0.5 we can ignore the combined moment and shear if it's not then we have to um as as it's low shear okay we call it low shear once it's less than 0 0.5 okay so we have low shear which is basically in this area here that's the low shear uh, in there. So therefore, so this is a graph where we plot the uh, utilization ratio in shear force. So the shear force divided by the capacity against the utilization ratio in bending. So the bending force divided by uh, the capacity. So when the shear uh, demand divided by the capacity is 0.5 or lower, it's low shear. So therefore we can use the full capacity uh, in bending. So that's why we have uh, the bending um, Utilization ratio on bending, demand divided by the capacity is equal to one. Okay, so we don't need to reduce the capacity in bending if we have low shear. However, if the shear force um, divided by the capacity becomes higher than 0 0.5, so somewhere between 0 0.5 and 1, we have high shear. And you can see now, instead of using one as the utilization ratio for the moment, the demand divided by the capacity, we actually reduce it down. So, for example, if I take somewhere along uh, a shear here of 0.7, then 0.7 of a shear force, then it comes down here. If I use the equation 6.29, I come down here. And that gives me that I only have about 
you know, 80% or something like that uh, available in terms of the utilization ratio in, um, in bending because I'm using some of the material uh, in the flanges to withstand the, the shear force. Okay, uh, and so on. As I start to um, go up to say 100% utilization ratio in, in, in shear or towards 100% uh, utilization which I'll show you in a second uh, in the code, and that uh, will describe this part of the curve uh, here. But we have an alternative. We can use equation 6.30 for an I-beam, which is what we have designed here, and it gives us a better um, or a higher uh, capacity if we use that one. But we have an option to use either 6.29 or 6.30. So we can see 6.30 tells us that even if we're using 100% uh, of, the, of the capacity of the beam um, yeah, for shear, uh, we can still uh, use uh, up to this amount here of utilization ratio for a moment. Okay, so it looks like about 60% or something like that uh, is still available. That is because the capacity for shear, we're only taking into account um, the um, the web and a little bit of the flange to, to work out what the capacity is here. So we still have material left there in the flange uh, that's good, that we're keeping for, for bending. So that's why even though we have the full even though the, it's 100% utilized uh, for the shear, because we're only using part of the section uh, for it. So let's just draw it quickly here. So if that's the, the section. Oh, sorry, very bad drawing. Uh, we said for a shear, we're going to use all of the web and a little bit of the flange up here. Not a lot, but just the bit in here and this bit of the flange uh, here. Okay. So even if that's 100% used, uh, so I. Um, this value is equal to one. So we're using all that material. We still have, you know, we still have all this material out here at the side. We still have this material here. We still have this material here. We still have this material here. So that can be used for the uh, um, for the bending. So we still have this uh, um, utilization ratio so that's defined in the code uh, for bending uh, in here. Okay, because we have all of this other material uh, available to us. Okay, so we have all this material here, 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 here. So therefore, we're going to use that material, and that's going to help us define what this uh, this point is here. In other words, the utilization ratio that we can have uh, for for uh, for bending um, moments uh, given a high a high shear force. Okay. So, but typically we'll end up with our, our capacity divide our sorry demand divided by capacity in terms of shear less than 0.5 low shear, and then we can just have uh, the full utilization everything available to us um, for bending. Oh, basically all the material out in the flange available for, for bending. Okay. So those equations, so the equation uh, 629 and 630, let's look at those in a little bit more, more detail. Um, so equation 629 uh, tells us that we have to reduce the moment uh, capacity uh, down. So let's just uh, put that into practice. What does that mean? Um, so we, we had, so we have a, so for say, for example, for class one or class two section, we have a plastic resistance, which is the um, uh, WPL times FY over gamma uh, M naught, okay? But if we have high shear, if the utilization ratio for, for shear is greater than or equal to 0.5, then that implies MPLRD is equal to WPL, and then instead of just this value, we have to replace that value with this value uh, in there. So we put in uh, 1 minus rho times Fy all over gamma. Okay. So that's if we... Uh, so that's if we have high shear. So in other words, we're up in this area here. So the shear... Uh, demand divided by the capacity is more than 0.5. Uh, we're on equation 6.29, so describing this equation here, uh, in there. So we put in this, uh, we reduce the moment capacity down by a value here, this factor here, 1 minus rho. Where rho is defined here as 2 times the shear demand divided by the shear capacity minus 1 squared. Okay, so the bigger the demand is relative to the capacity, uh, the bigger rho is, the bigger rho is, then the smaller that the, that the um, so the bigger rho is, then the smaller uh, that the uh, that the moment capacity is going to be. Okay, so we already have worked out what the demand is, uh, VED, we've already worked out what the capacity is of the section, so it's a relatively straightforward calculation, we plug it into this formula here to get rho, 
uh, and then plug uh, this part into the equation here where we get the moment capacity is equal to the plastic modulus into one minus rho uh, fy over gamma m zero. So that's the equation uh, 6.29 when we look at the moment and shear interaction curve. We have an alternative here where we can use six, equation uh, 630 for an I-beam, which is defined uh, here. So the reduced design plastic resistance a moment, uh, plastic resistance moment, allowing for the shear force may alternatively be obtained for an I cross section with equal flanges and bending about the major axis as follows. So we can use this equation with the moment uh, due to the uh, being reduced due to the shear uh, demand on it, where it is the plastic capacity about the major axis minus rho into AW. Uh, squared uh, divided by 4 TW. So um, AW being the area of the web, so it's the height of the web minus the thickness of the web. So we've already worked out what the height of the web is. Uh, we know what the thickness of the web is, 10.1 in our example here. So we can plug that in there, plug it, that in, in here. We've worked out rho from the previous um, equation uh, here. Uh, and we know what the plastic modulus is straight from the blue book uh, and put that in there. But they, this value here obviously cannot be less than or equal to the um, overall capacity of the, the section. Okay, so that gives us the equation 630. Okay, so in our example uh, here, so we have um, moment and shear resistance. Sorry, not writing very well. Uh, so that was in 6.2.8. Okay, so we said that the utilization ratio for shear was 0.31, which is less than 0.5, which implies no shear. Um, no shear throughout. So in every, that's the highest um, value throughout the whole section. Um, so that implies that uh, the effect of uh, shear on the uh, bending uh, moment may be Okay, and we get that from 6.2.8, put uh, the second uh, clausal on there. Okay, so that means that the moment um, of resistance of the section uh, is equal to just the plastic uh, moment of resistance uh, throughout. Okay, so I did no reduction. Okay, so we're not going to reduce the moment down. Uh, in there, as we've seen from the moment. Uh, so that implies uh, moment and shear uh, together is okay because we don't have to even check it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the moment and shear uh, done. So just the last minute or so um, in deflection. So we're going to do deflection uh, and then we'll do the resistance transverse forces uh, later on. Um, so deflection, so up to now we're looking at ultimate limit state um, design. So ultimate limit state design where we have a factored up load. So it's 1.35 times dead load plus 1.5 uh, times live load. Whereas for the deflection, uh, it's serviceability limit state. Okay, so what does that mean? It means excessive serviceability deflections may impair the function of the structure. So it might lead to lead, um, cracking of the plaster from the, in the walls or in the ceiling, difficulty in opening doors. Um, it might end up that there's excess of um, deformation put on that might uh, cause the windows to crack and so on. So deflection checks are an important aspect of beam design and often can govern the design of a beam. Thus, the serviceability limit state, not the ultimate limit state, sorry, it's the serviceability limit state, not an ultimate limit state, meaning that we're dealing with a risk, not, not the risk of structural collapse, but of damage that is uh, um, that we don't want to happen or um, uncomfortable in, in, in the building uh, or aesthetic um, issues as well. So consequently, the unfactored load is generally utilized for the beam deflection checks, unlike bending and shear checks. So we have a we have a, a guidance for this. So vertical deflection limits usually is to, to, um, based on the span or the length. So if it's a cantilever, the maximum deflection should be the length divided by 180. If it's a beam carrying plaster or other brittle, it's span divided by 360. Um, other beams uh, span divided by 200 and so on. So in our example, uh, we've got a um, 
we've got a say a beam carrying um, brittle or other uh, failures. So, so we have a beam here that has uh, loading with a P and it's got a UDL on it, omega. Um, it's going to deflect down by a certain amount uh, here. So that deflection, the limit for the deflection, has to be less than or equal to span divided by 360. And that's less than or equal to 6,500 millimeters divided by 360 um, is the limit that we have uh, that we have uh, set um, because of the um, um, because it's a brittle failure. And then uh, what have we got? Well, we've got a point load here, and we've got a a UDL as well. So we have to use superposition where we have a point load and we have a UDL here. So therefore. Uh, the um, deflection of the section is going to be equal to 5 over 300 384 uh, omega L4 over EI. That's the that's due to the UDL uh, plus due to the point load uh, PL cubed over 48 uh, EI. Okay. Okay, so that's the deflection. So we, we're going to do, let's say, uh, if we look at what the deflection is due to, so due to impose load, due to impose load, we have the omega from the very start. Um, let's just write it down here. Sorry. It's due to the, the live load is, is equal to Q of K, which is 24.2 kilonewtons per meter uh, and the p is q of k so this is just due to the live load because we're concerned about the plaster and the walls that go in after um, the dead load is on it so um so we just want to check what is underneath the, the live load here at the moment so uh, q of k uh, in there was 48 kilonewtons okay so i'm going to uh, put those into the formula uh, in there so if we put up here in omega, we're going to put in 24.2 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, in P here, we're going to put in 48 kilonewtons. Um, the length, we've got 6.5 meters uh, in there. Uh, e, which is the Young's uh, modulus, and there we can put in 205 newtons per millimeter squared. Um, it's, it's always between 205 and 210 uh, newtons per, per millimeter squared uh, in there. So we put in, sorry, 210, uh, put in 210 uh, kilonewtons, not newtons, sorry, kilonewtons per millimeter squared. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's E. And I, we're going to get um, directly from the, the, blue, the blue book, so we make sure we get I about the major axis because it's deflecting about the major axis and that's going to come uh, directly out of the about the blue book uh, and you'll get that value as 55,000 uh, uh, centimeters to power four okay so when you put all of that uh, in here we're going to get the limit underneath the live load uh, from those equations uh, of equal to if I have it done right, 7.18 millimeters uh, in there. Okay, and we have to make sure that that's less than or equal to 6,500 divided by 360, uh, which is equal to uh, which is equal to 18 18.1 18 millimeters. So it implies it's okay in deflection. Okay, sorry, I just rushed that last bit because I just run out of time. So that's the deflection. So we've done the deflection check uh, in there. So it's fine in deflection. And then the last uh, check we need to do is the resistance to transverse force check. So we're going to do that in the next class. We'll come back to that at, at two o'clock um, to go through the design, uh, the resistance to the transverse forces check. Uh, and then we'll start up the, the project as well uh, this afternoon. Okay. So does anyone have any uh, questions?